Boa tarde a todo mundo. Estamos iniciando aqui a sessão de conferência do primeiro seminário do Grupo Rastros. O Grupo Rastros é o grupo de estudos de memórias e tradições cristãs e judaicas, que é liderado por mim e pelo professor Paulo, quem eu estou iniciando aqui na transmissão. Professor Paulo, boa tarde. Boa tarde, boa tarde a todas e todos que nos acompanham. E é uma alegria aqui podermos inaugurar esse seminário com alguém tão importante como o professor Matias. Parabéns Perfeito. pelo convite, Marcelo, e que coisa boa começarmos dessa forma. Maravilha. O nosso grupo começou no ano passado, esse é o primeiro evento que a gente está fazendo de maneira aberta, e nós pretendemos ter é, muitos projetos assim, para divulgação de, de pesquisas nesse campo do cristianismo primitivo, judaísmo do segundo templo, que é um campo muito grande, muito amplo, evidentemente, mas que existem muitas lacunas ainda a serem pesquisadas, né, Paulo? Então, Exato. nós vamos aqui introduzir o, o professor, mas antes eu vou chamar também o nosso parceiro que vai nos ajudar hoje, que é o Carlos Guilherme, que vai ser o nosso tradutor, é, não simultâneo, mas tradutor consecutivo, ao final da, da apresentação do professor Matias. Bem-vindo, Carlos. Olá. E, finalmente, a pessoa que hoje nos, nos ajuda a ter essa... que faz acontecer esse momento, e eu quero já deixar aqui uma boa tarde a todo mundo, é o professor Matias Renzi, que eu vou agora introduzir. Hi, Matias! Hello! It's very good to be with you. It's very good to be for us to... Carlos, uh, é um poder. prazer estar com vocês todos, todas. Eu vou falar em português para o Carlos traduzir para o Matias, até para que todo mundo possa acompanhar. Matias, é uma alegria, então, que você esteja conosco nessa tarde. We're so glad to have you here with us this afternoon, Professor Matias. E você, Thank eu sei you. que você It's fala da Alemanha. Eu sei que você fala de Heidelberg. I know you're speaking from Heidelberg. Yes, I am in Germany right now. That is correct. Even though normally I live in the United States, but I am here for four months to do research. Uh, é, eu, eu na verdade moro nos Estados Unidos, mas estou aqui na Alemanha por quatro meses para fins de pesquisa. É, então, para a gente é um prazer você, mesmo aí em trânsito, poder nos brindar com essa apresentação hoje. Uh, and so we're very glad to know that despite you being away, uh, and you are able to join us in this, uh, for this lecture. I am delighted to be with you. Elis está te saudando. Elis Soares está te saudando. Uh, 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 Elis, Elis Angela is uh, saluting you. Yes, hi Elis. <laughs> Aliás, eu quero agradecer desde já a duas pessoas que me ajudaram a também nesse processo, que é a própria Elisângela e o, o Marcos Félix, que fazem parte do grupo, que traduziram a conferência para nós podermos preparar as legendas da apresentação. And a word of gratitude to Marcos and Elis that have prepared this translation beforehand. So we are able to use them as subtitles to Professor Matias' presentation. Perfect. Eu vou agora apresentar o professor Matias formalmente para que todos conheçam a, um pouco a biografia dele. Uh, so now your formal introduction, Professor Matias, so people can get to know your academic credentials. Ele tem mestrado em teologia pela Universidade de Heidelberg, Alemanha, em 1992. Uh, uh, he got a master's degree from Heidelberg University in 1992. Doutorado em Harvard pelo Departamento de Línguas e Civilizações do Oriente Próximo. And you've got uh, your doctorate at Harvard. Matias também atua e atua agora profissionalmente na Rice University desde 2012. And you've been teaching at Rice University since to, uh, 2012. E atualmente no departamento de religião e no programa de estudos judaicos. And uh, you're currently at the Department of Religion and Jewish Studies. Autor de várias produções sobre o período eh, do Segundo Templo. You've written a, a few books on the second period, second temple, second temple period. 
é, tem apenas uma obra traduzida em português, que é da qual nós falamos. So Yeah, yeah. So far, you've got only one uh, text translated into Portuguese, and we're going to speak uh, a little bit about that. Uh -huh. A produção do Matias está totalmente ligada aos textos judaicos do período do Segundo Templo. And, and your academic research is comprised of this precisely about this period of the Second Jewish uh, Second Temple period. Com ênfase nos textos pseudepígrafos judaicos. And you emphasize. The Jewish pseudepigrapher. Uh -huh. Vocês vão ver que ele tem um profundo conhecimento do assunto, aliado a uma didática de introdução. And uh, I am sure uh, uh, students will notice that you have a deep knowledge about the subject, but also that you are able to 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 very clearly uh, introduce the subject to students. Mas não se enganem, a fluidez na linguagem, na forma de abordar o conteúdo, não indica superficialidade ou, é, sabe, pouco conhecimento. And, but make no mistake uh, that uh, this fluid form and this uh, approachable uh, way through which you ex uh, expose the subject is, is, doesn't mean that it's shallow, much to the contrary. Então nós vamos iniciar a conferência com o professor... Matias. So we get we get started. Uh, thank you very much for this introduction. Um, I would like to start out by thanking Professor Marcelo Carneiro and all my wonderful colleagues in Brazil for this invitation. Um, I am delighted to be with you. Apenas para para não ficar sem, sem a fala, o Carlos vai, vai traduzir esse, esse comentário dele. Uh, é uma grande alegria poder estar com vocês aqui no Brasil, nesse tempo de pesquisa, e eu agradeço muito ao professor Marcelo, ao professor Paulo, pela oportunidade, pelo convite de estar com vocês nessa tarde. All right, let's begin. The Old Testament is a library of diverse and originally independent books, a colorful, heterogeneous collection of disparate texts. These texts were written over a long period of time, possibly about 800 years. It was only long after they had been written that these books were put together to form the Bible as we have it today. <clears throat> Modern biblical scholarship that is, the academic study of the Bible, has existed for about 200 years. Since the very beginning of biblical studies as an academic discipline, scholars have focused primarily on what they considered to be the oldest texts of the Old Testament. The Torah, that is, the five books of Moses, and the great prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, have always attracted most of the scholarly attention. To these scholars, these books, these biblical books, particularly the writings of the prophets, represent the true Israel. Moses, Isaiah, and Jeremiah stand for the best days of ancient Israel, the high point of Israelite religion. The texts that were written during the later periods were significantly less attractive. There are many reasons why these oldest texts of the Old Testament came to be seen as the core of the Old Testament and the truest form of Israelite religion. One reason was a certain understanding of history. Many biblical scholars, particularly of the late 19th and 20th centuries, shared the belief that the early phase of Israel's religion was a period of purity of fresh revelations when God still spoke directly to Moses and the prophets. As time went on, the religion of Israel changed and not for the better. It deteriorated. Religious institutions took over and suppressed the free spirit of the origins, 
Rules and regulations came to govern every aspect of the religious life. Gone were the free origins, and the religion of Israel became increasingly obsessed with following the law. German biblical scholars called this form of Judaism of late, the late biblical period Spätjudentum, or late Judaism. By late, they meant late compared to the prophetic origins. The term late Judaism was intended to be derogatory. A fair number of early biblical scholars, particularly European Protestant scholars, were not free of anti-Semitic sentiments. To them, post-biblical or rabbinic Judaism was a distortion of the true religion of ancient Israel, a sad and most unfortunate deterioration of the prophetic origins. They thought that rabbinic Judaism is a religion obsessed with keeping the letter of the law, with no traces left of the free spirit of the prophets. These scholars believed that this process of deterioration, the downward development of the religion of Israel, began already during biblical times and ultimately resulted in rabbinic Judaism. Since the 1960s and 70s, we have seen a remarkable change in biblical scholarship. While the older texts of the Old Testament continue to receive much attention, a growing number of scholars from around the globe have developed an interest in the Jewish writings from the end of the period we associated with the Old Testament, as well as from the so-called intertestamental period, that is, the time in between the Old and the New Testament. I consider this new interest in Israel's forgotten literature the single most important and promising development in the field of biblical studies of the last 100 years. What has motivated scholars to turn their attention to the later books? There are a number of factors that contributed to this change in our academic discipline. One factor was the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1940s and 1950s. The Dead Sea Scrolls are ancient Jewish manuscripts discovered in 11 caves along the northwestern shore of the Dead Sea. They were written from about the second century BCE, before the Common Era, to the first century CE of the Common Era. These ancient Jewish manuscripts were left behind by a relatively small Jewish community that lived at a place called Qumran for about 200 years. The Dead Sea Scrolls are important because they include the oldest biblical manuscripts known to exist. They're also important because among them, many texts were discovered that had not been known before. Texts about the community itself, about its inner organization and theological beliefs, and the disputes it had with other communities. The scrolls generated an enormous amount of interest, both among scholars and among the general public. Here we have a significant library of texts from an ancient Jewish group, texts we had not known before, that shed much light on Judaism of the turn of the common era. It is as if somebody had opened a door for us and led us into a room full of ancient Jewish texts from the centuries before Jesus. The discovery led to a major reevaluation of what we had known about the time period. Another reason why scholars became interested in the later writings of ancient Israel was the exploration of the Middle East. Throughout the 19th century, explorers traveled throughout the Middle East in search of the places mentioned in the Bible. They also collected ancient manuscripts written in the languages of the Oriental churches, such as Coptic, Armenian, Ethiopic, Aramaic, Syriac, and Arabic. And they brought these manuscripts with them to Europe. When they started to read them, 
they discovered a wealth of ancient Jewish writings, texts like the Ethiopic Apocalypse of Enoch or the Book of Jubilees. I'll say more about these two texts in a moment. At first, these ancient unknown texts attracted only little attention. This changed, however, when copies of them were discovered among the Dead Sea Scrolls written in their original languages. It even became clear that for the community that left us the scrolls, some of these texts were authoritative, meaning that they were part of their Bible. Modern scholars call these texts the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha. Most of them stem from the later period of the Old Testament. They have completely changed our understanding of the early history of Judaism. A third factor, finally, that has led to a re-evaluation in the field of biblical studies was the Holocaust. After 1945, biblical scholars were forced to confront the fact that their model of Spätjudentum or late Judaism was deeply anti-Semitic and had contributed to anti-Jewish sentiments in Germany and elsewhere. Their description of rabbinic Judaism as a religion that was obsessed with the law was based on old stereotypes, on anti-Jewish prejudices with deep roots in the Middle Ages. It became clear that too often scholars had uncritically adopted these stereotypes and projected them back onto the Jewish texts from antiquity. The Holocaust was a wake-up call. It forced Christian scholars to face the anti-Semitic tendencies in their own discipline. Also, beginning in the middle of the 20th century, a growing number of Jewish scholars, particularly in the United States, began to teach at major US universities. Their presence has been an important corrective to some misguided perceptions of Judaism. Plus it enabled a more robust conversation between Jewish and Christian scholars of the time. In my talk today, I want to reflect on this relatively new interest in Israel's forgotten literature. I will do this in three steps. First, we need to look at a timeline to become clear about some of the dates and what we mean by early and late. Second, I want to introduce to you some of the most important Jewish texts of the period and talk about why they are important. And third and finally, I will discuss why this topic is so important for our study of Judaism and Christianity in general. What is really at stake here? And what do we learn beyond adding a few new texts to our curriculum? Part one, the history of ancient Israel and the first and the second temple period. Let's review some dates first. The Old Testament was written over a period of about 800 or 900 years from the 10th century BCE to the second century BCE. It is customary among scholars to divide this long stretch of time into two periods, named after the two temples in Jerusalem. The first temple period began in the 10th century BCE, when King Solomon built the first temple in Jerusalem. And it ended in the sixth century BCE, when the Solomonic temple was destroyed by the Neo-Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. The second temple period that began in the late 6th century BCE with the rebuilding of the Jerusalem temple following the Babylonian exile ended in the first century of the common era when the second temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. The first and the second temple periods were dramatically different from each other in many ways. 
Here, I will briefly focus on six of these differences. One, with the end of the first temple period and the Israelites' return from the Babylonian exile, the monarchy in Israel came to an end. During the second temple period, Israel was no longer governed by kings. In fact, the Davidic dynasty came to an end and there has never been a king on the throne again in Israel ever since. Two, the role of the Jerusalem temple as a central unifying force was greatly diminished. The temple no longer had the authority it used to have during the first temple period. And Jewish communities began to form away from the temple. Three, the diaspora, that is Jews living outside the land of Israel, became a permanent reality in Judaism. There were Jewish communities in Egypt, Babylon, and Persia. Of course, this has changed to this very day. And the Jewish diaspora communities, with Jewish diaspora communities flourishing all over the world. Four, Jewish society became increasingly fragmented during the Second Temple period and splintered into ever new groups. These groups included the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes to name only three, but there were many other groups as well. These groups were constantly engaged in a rigorous exchange of ideas with each other. In its origin, the Jesus movement was one of these many Jewish groups that formed during the Second Temple period. Five, the art of writing became much more prominent during the Second Temple period. The word of God was no longer exclusively a spoken word. It came to be written down and collections of authoritative texts began to form. Where there are authoritative texts, there are communities that form around these texts based on their particular understandings of these texts. And there are interpretations and commentaries. The second temple period thus saw the beginnings of the formation of the Bible and of biblical interpretation. And six, new religious institutions came into being. Among them, the office of the scribe as the guardian of the sacred scriptures. The synagogue as a place of meetings, study, and worship and the rabbi as the community leader. In brief, Israel's religion of the second temple period looked dramatically different from the religion of the first temple period. It saw the emergence of many features we associate with Judaism today. Synagogues, rabbis, different Jewish communities that formed around scripture, regular community meetings, biblical interpretation, and more formalized forms of prayer independent of the temple. Some scholars even speak of the democratization of the Jewish religion during the second temple period. All of these features are familiar to us from Judaism today. My point is that none of them existed during the first temple period, that is prior to the Babylonian exile. They came into being during the second temple period. They changed Judaism forever and they are with us to this very day. But let us return to the issue of dates for just a moment. When were the books of the Old Testament written? Most scholars would agree that the Torah and the books of the major prophets reached the form in which they appear in our Bibles shortly after the Babylonian exile, perhaps in the fifth century BCE. There's a small handful of Old Testament books that were written in the fourth century BCE, 
Most scholars would include among them the Book of Esther, Kohelet, First and Second Chronicles, and possibly a number of Psalms. But it is fair to say that the Old Testament, as we have it today, was finished by the fourth century BCE. The only exception is the book of Daniel, which we can date securely to the second century BCE. By and large, we can say that by the fourth century BCE, all the books we now have in our Old Testament were written with the exception of the book of Daniel. The New Testament was written over a much shorter time span about half a century to be exact. The earliest Christian authors wrote during the latter half of the first century from about the year 50 to around the year 100 CE of the common era. Of course, the early Christians continued to write beyond that time. In fact, if anything, they wrote more during the second century than during the first. But these texts didn't make it into the New Testament. Why does all of this matter? There are two insights I want you to take away from all of this. The first is that there is a significant period of about 400 or so years in between the Old and the New Testament. From these four centuries, we have no writings in our Christian Bibles. When we go from the end of the Old Testament to the beginning of the New Testament, we are skipping over almost half a millennium, the dark ages of ancient Israel. A few years ago, I wrote a book about these gap years titled Mind the Gap. In it, I write about the significance of these years for our understanding of Jesus and of his followers, a topic I will address in just a moment. The second insight I want you to take away concerns the term the Second Temple Period. I said a moment ago that the Second Temple Period lasted from the 6th century BCE, when the Second Temple was inaugurated in Jerusalem following the end of the Babylonian exile, and it came to an end in the 1st century CE when that temple was destroyed. I also explained that the last books of the Old Testament were written during the fourth century BCE. That means that while the biblical books somehow stop in the fourth century BCE, the second temple period lasted much longer. The scribes at the time were busy preserving the books that came to be their Bible, but they also wrote new texts, many new texts that for complicated reasons, never made it into our Bibles. Scholars use different terms to refer to this rich corpus of writings. Some call it the Jewish writings of the Second Temple period. Some call it the books of early Judaism. Early Judaism is a term coined in response to the derogatory term late Judaism, used by German scholars of a certain anti-Semitic bend. Regardless of whether we call it Second Temple Judaism or Early Judaism, what matters to us is to understand that the late books of the Old Testament form only a small part of this early Jewish library. Indeed, this collection of early Jewish literature includes many other books, writings from outside the Bible that aren't very well known, not by Jews, and not by Christians. So, what are these texts? This brings me to the second part of my talk. Part two, the Jewish books of the second temple period. The corpus of early Jewish literature is vast and the texts in question variegated. That means that here, I can only choose some examples to give you a small taste of the richness of this little known literature. I have chosen five literary examples, each reflecting a different aspect of Second Temple Jewish literature. 
If all you read was the Bible, chances are that you wouldn't know about any of them. They are the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Septuagint, Philo of Alexandria, the Ethiopic Apocalypse of Enoch, and the Book of Jubilees. Let me go through them one by one. First, the Dead Sea Scrolls. I begin not with a text, but with an entire library of texts I have mentioned already, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Towards the end of the second century BCE, a fairly small group of men, perhaps 200 or so, decided to move into the desert next to the Dead Sea on what today is the border between the state of Israel and Jordan. There, they started a strictly regulated hierarchical settlement that resembled later Christian monasteries. The group, which many scholars today associate with the Essenes, was highly literate. They wrote many texts of their own, but they also copied much of the literature that was in circulation during their time. Significantly for us, they stored all of these texts in 11 caves near their compound, where, thanks to the dry climate, they survived until they were discovered in the middle of the 20th century. There are about 900 or so scrolls, known today as the Dead Sea Scrolls, written on animal skin, in black ink, in Hebrew and Aramaic. They afford us a rare glimpse of the Jewish literature that was read throughout the land of Israel. The oldest scrolls date from the third century BCE, and the last texts were written in the middle of the first century of the Common Era, just before their settlement was destroyed by the Romans in the year 68 of the Common Era. The scrolls include copies of the books of the Old Testament, commentaries on the Bible, rule books that explain the organization and the rules of the community, liturgical texts and prayers, and apocalyptic texts that describe how the group thought about the end of time. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls has been called the most important manuscript discovery of the 20th century, and that's no exaggeration. Second, the Septuagint. The Second Temple period was a time of political turmoil and change. The land of Israel was hardly ever independent. Instead, it was subject to whoever the superpower of the day happened to be, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, or the Romans. For in the fourth century BCE, Alexander the Great conquered the known world, including ancient Israel. As a result, the Greek language and culture swept over the region. And everybody, including the Jewish communities throughout the ancient Near East, became Hellenized, meaning they adopted Greek culture, language, and the way of life. This is also true of the Jewish community in Egypt. In fact, Greek became their first language. And so it wasn't long before they translated their holy books or Bible into Greek. This was the first translation of the Bible that was ever made from Hebrew into Greek. That translation is known today as the Septuagint, a word that means 70. The title is based on a legend that tells the beautiful story of 70 or 72 translators who traveled from Israel to Egypt to translate the Hebrew Bible into Greek. Over the last 30 or so years, the Septuagint has become an academic field of study all by itself, with many scholars working exclusively on the Septuagint and many dissertations written in Septuagint studies. Why is the Septuagint so significant? 
Of the many reasons one could give, I mention two. First, the Septuagint is not a precise translation of the Hebrew text. It differs in many places. What is more, there are several books included in the Septuagint that are not part of the Hebrew Bible. These extra books are known as the Apocrypha. That means that the Septuagint differs in important ways from the Hebrew Bible, which tells us a great deal about the history of the Bible and of the biblical text. The second reason why the Septuagint is so important is that the followers of Jesus soon adopted the Septuagint as their Bible. Christianity spread very quickly in Greek-speaking lands. The New Testament is written in Greek. And so it happens that the Septuagint and not the Hebrew Bible became the Bible of the early Jesus movement. Third, Philo of Alexandria. The Jewish community of ancient Egypt did not only give us the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Bible, its most famous member was Philo of Alexandria, a most prolific author of many books on the Bible and biblical topics. Philo lived from the year 20 BCE to about the year 50 CE. Coming from a wealthy and most distinguished family in Alexandria in Northern Egypt, Philo is the most prominent member of the Alexandrian Jewish community. In his extensive work, Philo combines two worlds that we normally do not bring together. On the one hand, Philo was well-educated in Greek philosophy and thought. He wrote in Greek, and it is clear that he was well familiar with the writings of Plato. On the other hand, Philo was highly educated in Judaism, and indeed, he mostly wrote commentaries and treatises on the Bible, particularly on the Torah. For Philo, these two worlds, the world of Hellenism and of Judaism, were fully compatible. And he wrote much of his work demonstrating how one should not see them as opposites, but how one could participate in both of these worlds. Philo is perhaps best known for his allegorical interpretation of the Bible. He used allegory as a way of demonstrating that Hellenism and Judaism had in common. I mention Philo of Alexandria here because he's the most important representative of what we call Hellenistic Judaism, a form of Judaism that embraces Greek philosophy, language, and culture and that even today is too often overlooked by scholars for whom Judaism is simply rabbinic Judaism. Fourth, the Ethiopic Apocalypse of Enoch, or First Enoch. Enoch is a little known figure. He is mentioned briefly in chapter five of the book of Genesis in a list of names from Adam to Noah. There we read that Enoch lived 365 years and that he never died because God took him. From about the third century BCE onward, several books came to be written that were attributed to Enoch. Enoch did not write these books. The authors simply used Enoch as their pseudonym. At the center of these Enochic books, we find the story of the fallen angels, heavenly angels who surrendered their angelic status, came down to earth and who had sex with human women. When they realized what they had done and God was about to punish them, they asked Enoch to intercede on their behalf before God. The books that are attributed to Enoch are Apocalypses, like the book of Revelation in the New Testament. They are concerned with the end of history as we know it. Many of the Enochic writings were known to the members of the Qumran community, the group that left us the Dead Sea Scrolls. Among the scrolls, 
scholars found the oldest known copies of some of these Enochic books. Indeed, it seems very likely that the community considered the writings of Enoch authoritative, meaning that they were part of their Bible at Qumran. Eventually, several of the Enochic books were combined into one long book of Enoch. That book survives in its entirety only in Ethiopic, one of the languages of the African Orthodox churches. This is why scholars today refer to it as Ethiopic Enoch or First Enoch. An Ethiopic copy of First Enoch was first brought to Europe in the first half of the 19th century by an early explorer of the Middle East. And it sparked some of the very first interest in Israel's forgotten writings. Fifth and finally, the Book of Jubilees. The Book of Jubilees is yet another book that survives in its entirety only in Ethiopic, and that is part of the Bible of the Ethiopic Church. Like Ethiopic Enoch, copies of the Book of Jubilees were also found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. And there's good reason to believe that the community considered it to be a sacred book too. The Book of Jubilees is an interpretation of the book of Genesis and the first half of the book of Exodus. It gets its name from the book of Leviticus, chapter 25. There we read that every 50th year, the Israelites were supposed to declare a jubilee year. The Israelites were supposed to forgive all debt and to set the slaves free. Jubilees, our book of Jubilees, has no interest in the release of dead or slaves, but it rewrites Israel's history and organizes the events we read about in the Bible in terms of Jubilees or sections of 50 years. The book of Jubilees was written in the second century BCE. One of my scholarly interests is in the history of biblical interpretation. I'm interested in the very beginnings of biblical interpretation. Who were the first people to interpret the Bible? How did Jews who lived in pre-Christian times read their Hebrew Bible? Did the earliest followers of Jesus read the Bible like other Jews of their time? Or did they come up with new interpretations? When Paul writes about the Jews of his time, what do we actually know about these Jews, apart from what Paul himself tells us about them? To answer all of these questions, books like First Enoch and the Book of Jubilees are invaluable. They tell us a great deal about Jews in post-biblical pre-Christian times. I have chosen these five examples the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Septuagint, Philo of Alexandria, Enochic Enoch, and the Book of Jubilees, to give you a taste of the breadth of early Judaism and its enormous scholarly output. There are entire libraries for us to study that we would miss if all we read was the Bible. Since the middle of the 20th century, a group of international scholars has begun to explore systematically the Jewish writings of the Second Temple period. As a result, our understanding of Second Temple Judaism and its library has changed dramatically. It is now clear that Judaism before and during the time of Jesus was much more diverse and complex than previously thought. Of course, it is very interesting to study all of this material for its own sake. Today, there are scholars who study exclusively the Dead Sea Scrolls or the Septuagint. And there's even a group called the Enoch Seminar, an international organization of scholars devoted to the study of the Enochic books. But we might also wonder, what is the broader significance of this literature? How does the study of early Judaism change our understanding of Judaism and Christianity more broadly? 
This brings me to the third and final part of my paper. Part three, the significance of second temple Judaism. A moment, uh, we have a, a, a little problem with the slides. I'm, I'm, in, I'm figure now and uh, I'm, I mean, I'm call Carlos Guilherme for um, a pause. And in this pause, please talk about your book, uh, <laughs> Mind the Gap. Okay. Então, gente, é o seguinte, deixa eu explicar. Teve um problema pequeno aqui. Na... Não sei se é pequeno, mas eu vou recuperar o restante das legendas. E enquanto eu faço isso, o Carlos Guilherme vai... É, o, o professor vai falar do livro é, Cuidado com o Vão e Carlos Guilherme vai fazer a, a tradução. So in this book, Mind the Gap, I take a closer look at the years in between the Old and the New Testament. Bom, nesse livro que escrevi, Cuidado com o Vão, eu observo mais de perto esse período entre o judaísmo do segundo tempo, o final do Antigo Testamento e o início do Novo Testamento. The book begins with a simple observation. Eu parto de uma observação simples. When we read in the Gospels about Jesus, we see that Jesus participates in the Judaism of his time. Quando a gente lê os relatos sobre Jesus nos Evangelhos, a gente o vê participando uh, do judaísmo no tempo. For example, the disciples of Jesus call him a rabbi. Por exemplo, os seus discípulos lhe chamam de rabino. We read in the Gospels that Jesus went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Uh, vimos em determinada passagem que Jesus vai à sinagoga no sábado. We read in the Gospels that Jesus discussed matters of the law and biblical interpretation with the Jewish intellectuals, though particularly with the Pharisees. Uh, e nós vemos nas passagens dos evangelhos que Jesus se envolve em discussões de lei judaica com os intelectuais da época, particularmente com os fariseus. And many of the teachings of Jesus also derive from the Judaism of his time. E muitos dos ensinamentos de Jesus também são derivados do judaísmo da sua época. For example, he taught about the end of days, using apocalyptic language. Ele falava sobre o final dos tempos, lançando mão da linguagem apocalíptica. There is the belief in a Messiah who would come at the end of time, which was also derived from Judaism. Uh, havia a crença no Messias que viria no final dos tempos e que é uma crença derivada do judaísmo da época. And of course, Christians believe in the resurrection of the dead. Paul writes about it in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, e os primeiros cristãos, cristãs, criam na ressurreição dos mortos. Paulo, por exemplo, escreve sobre isso no capítulo 15 da primeira carta aos Coríntios. So the point I'm making is that none of the elements I just mentioned are ever mentioned in the Old Testament. Uh, e parte da, do meu argumento é que estas noções que eu acabei de mencionar não estão presentes no Antigo Testamento. There are no rabbis in the Old Testament. Não há rabinos no Antigo Testamento. There's no synagogue in the Old Testament. Tampouco há sinagogas no Antigo Testamento. There are no Pharisees in the Old Testament. Nem fariseus. And I could go on and on and on. Eu podia falar bastante, seguir em frente nesse assunto. That means that the Judaism of Jesus did not simply emerge out of the Old Testament. Isso significa dizer que o judaísmo de Jesus Cristo não surgiu apenas do Antigo Testamento. Rather, the Judaism we find in the New Testament 
is the Judaism of the Second Temple period. Ao invés disso, o judaísmo que vemos no Novo Testamento é o judaísmo do período do Segundo Templo. It is also striking that the authors of the New Testament hardly ever explain to us what this Judaism was. E, e chama muita atenção o fato de que os autores do Novo Testamento não, não explicam no que consiste esse judaísmo. They expect that we know. Eles esperam que a gente já saiba o que é. Eles pressupõem que saibamos. And so for us to know what they expect us to know, we need to read beyond the biblical texts and we need to read the Jewish literature of the Second Temple period. Então, para a gente conhecer esses, essas, esses pressupostos que eles tinham, precisamos lançar a mão dessa literatura uh, extra-bíblica nesse período do segundo templo. Professor Marcelo. Ok. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Bom, gente, depois a gente pode até voltar a falar desse livro, mas agora a gente vai para a segunda parte. Vamos retomar a, a apresentação. So, back to the presentation. Great, thank you. Part three, the significance of Second Temple Judaism for Judaism and Christianity. I begin with Judaism. Why is the study of early Judaism important for our understanding of Judaism? To answer that question, we first need to clarify what we mean by Judaism. Judaism today is rabbinic Judaism, a particular form of Judaism that did not exist during the time of the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. As I just mentioned, there are no rabbis in the Old Testament. Rather, rabbinic Judaism began to form early in the first century CE. This is why some of the disciples called Jesus rabbi. When in the year 70, the Romans destroyed the second temple in Jerusalem, Judaism had to reinvent itself. There needed to be a form of Judaism without a temple in Jerusalem. The answer was rabbinic Judaism, a form of Judaism organized in local communities around synagogues, community gatherings, common study, and regulated prayer. The early rabbis who lived in the first and second centuries CE were pragmatists. Their primary concern was to regulate life, to stipulate what could and could not be done on the Sabbath day, what prayers to say when, and so forth. They were much less interested in speculations about the end of time, about angels and demonic beings or the world to come. Their focus was on the religious law or what we call halacha. The rabbinic movement became dominant after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, precisely at the time when the great diversity of second temple Jewish groups began to fade. What used to be many groups during the second temple period became the rabbinic movement after the year 70. It does not surprise therefore to see that many of the ideas and religious concepts we find in Second Temple Judaism survive and resurface in the writings of the rabbis. We could even say that it is impossible to understand the origins of rabbinic Judaism without understanding Second Temple Judaism. Let me give you a few examples. As I mentioned, the rabbis were primarily interested in Jewish law or halacha, so were the members of the group that left us the Dead Sea Scrolls. There are several so-called rule texts among the scrolls that specifically discuss Jewish law in great detail. With the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we can now compare Qumran law of the second and first centuries BCE with rabbinic law of the first and second centuries CE. What we find is that some laws and their derivation from scripture are almost the same, such as, for example, the statement that the Sabbath day be
begins on Friday at sunset, or the requirement to wear clean clothes on the Sabbath. Other laws differ more extensively. For example, the rule stipulating how to set up courts of 10 judges to judge issues of Jewish civil law. These differences almost always uh, derive from different interpretations of scripture. A good example would be the Temple Scroll, one of the longest intact manuscripts from the Dead Sea Scrolls, whose many laws and interpretations vary with those of the rabbis. Another field of comparative study concerns liturgies and prayers. The rabbis were particularly concerned with the regulation of Jewish prayer, both in private and in public. The literature from the Second Temple period includes many prayers, so that now we can compare early Jewish and rabbinic prayers. Here too, we find many forms of continuity. Both sides require, for example, that a benediction of lights be part of the service each morning and afternoon or evening. Second Temple liturgy also played a major role in the development of Jewish religious poetry. Much of the religious poetry of early Judaism found its way into the rich literature of rabbinic Judaism. One of the most basic prayers in Judaism today, known as the Amidah, has several parts in it whose origins we can trace back to early Judaism. There may also be some social connections. Scholars have long claimed, for example, that there is a direct line of continuity from the Pharisees about whom we read in the rabbinic writings and in the New Testament to the rabbis. It is widely believed that the Pharisees were the precursors of the rabbis. There are indeed many lines of continuity, but the rich literature of the Second Temple period now tells us that things were not that simple. It now appears that the rabbis were heirs to many groups not only to the Pharisees. Finally, let me turn briefly to the significance of early Judaism for our understanding of Jesus and of the early Jesus movement. I begin with the obvious. Jesus and his first followers were not only Jews. They participated actively in the Jewish life of their time. Think about the Gospels. Time and again, we find Jesus discuss an issue of biblical interpretation or religious law with the Jewish intellectuals of the time, and particularly with the Pharisees. This is exactly what the rabbis did, discuss all aspects of the religious life. Since Jesus was Jewish and participated in the religious life of his time, we might wonder what we actually know about Jesus' Judaism. How can we understand Jesus when we don't understand his Judaism. Here we need to go back to what I said earlier about the religious changes that happened during the second temple period. I listed a few new features that emerged during second temple times. I mentioned the significance of writing, the word of God being written down. I mentioned the art of biblical interpretation. Synagogues appeared and rabbis. And Judaism became fragmented into many groups and nurtured a culture of constant dispute. All of these features are immediately relevant for our understanding of Jesus and his followers. Jesus taught at the synagogue, he interpreted scripture, and he discussed Jewish law with the Pharisees. It is impossible to understand Jesus' Judaism without any knowledge of the Judaism of the Second Temple period simply because Jesus' Judaism is the Judaism of the Second Temple period. The Old Testament alone cannot explain Jesus' religion because many of the features that are so important to us, rabbis and the Pharisees, and synagogues and the belief in a Messiah, do not exist in the Old Testament. They came into being during the Second Temple period. For several decades after the death of Jesus, the ethos of the Jerusalem community remained Jewish. According to the book of Acts in the New Testament, the members of the Jesus movement 
sacrificed in the temple. They practiced a communal lifestyle that focused on the sharing of goods and common prayer. In fact, as has often been observed, their highly regulated communal life closely resembled that of the Qumran community. They attracted priests and Pharisees to their ranks. The followers of Jesus also practiced traditional forms of Jewish piety, such as fasting, almsgiving, Torah study, and observance of holy days. It was only at a later point, as increasing numbers of non-Jews joined the Jesus movement, that they slowly began to drift away from their Jewish origins. The missionary activities of the Apostle Paul in the non-Jewish world played a major role in the process. But it wouldn't be for a very long time after the death of Jesus that we can speak of Christianity as its own religion, now fully independent of Judaism. Conclusion. Let me bring my brief overview of early Judaism and its significance for Judaism and Christianity to an end with a couple of concluding thoughts. Early biblical scholars focused almost exclusively on the biblical books of the first temple period and showed little interest in the second temple period. This had to do in part with their belief that to them, the early writings present the origins of Israelite religion, the purest form of Israel's interactions with her God. It was also based on a deep mistrust of later forms of Judaism, particularly of rabbinic Judaism. Also, these scholars did not have access to many of the early Jewish texts we have today. All of this changed in the wake of World War II with the recognition of theological anti-Semitism, the study of the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha, and most importantly, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The literature of early Judaism fills an important gap between the Old and the New Testament for Christians and between the Hebrew Bible and the first rabbinic writings for Jews. We now know much more about the complexity of early Judaism than we did only, uh, only a few decades ago. If I had to summarize the significance of early Jewish writings in one word, that word would be diversity. The early Jewish texts bear witness to a Jewish society that was exceedingly diverse, consisting of many different groups who wrote many different books that reflect their many different worldviews, religious practices, and theological beliefs, groups that were constantly in discussion with each other. Just as there is no one Judaism or Christianity today, so there was no one Judaism or Christianity in antiquity. This diversity among both Jews and Christians was soon suppressed. On the Jewish side, the rabbis gradually took over and simply stopped copying many of the early Jewish texts that were not to their liking. And on the Christian side, the church fathers of the second and third centuries acted strongly against the proliferation of different expressions of the faith. As a result, the great diversity that is the hallmark of early Judaism was soon replaced with forms of orthodoxy on both the Jewish and Christian side. But I leave that process for another talk. Thank you very much for your interest. Muito obrigado, professor Matias pela sua apresentação. E agora eu vou passar a palavra para o Carlos Guilherme, que vai, apesar de que ainda, o Carlos, tem pouca gente é, fazendo ali uma interação, então nós vamos fazer aqui uma interação entre nós, 
deixar o Paulo fazer alguma questão, talvez. E eu tenho uma questão para o professor Matias, que você pode é, traduzir, por favor. Perfeitamente. Uh, é, uh... We are still uh, receiving students' questions, and so Professor Marcelo and Professor Paulo will start asking questions, and, and then we'll go perfect. on. Perfect. Yes, perfect. Okay. É, a minha questão, Matias, é a seguinte. No livro, você trabalha com... Você faz como um, um outro exemplo literário, segundo, segunda, segundo o livro de Baru, que é o e quarto Esdras. Queria uhum. saber se, é, em que, que eles também poderiam acrescentar naquilo que você apresentou para a gente hoje. Uh, in your book, you mentioned uh, two other works from the Second Temple period, uh, Second Baruch and then Fourth Ezra. And I would like you to elaborate uh, on what they would add to today's discussion. Hmm. So these two books, Second Baruch and Fourth Ezra, are two apocalyptic writings. Bom, uh, Segundo Baruch e Quarto Ezra são dois escritos apocalípticos. They were both written, presumably in Israel, towards the end of the first century. Uh, e a gente imagina que eles provavelmente foram escritos em Israel, perto do final do século I. That means, if you think of the New Testament canon, that they are contemporary with the Book of Revelation, the only full-blown apocalypse in the New Testament. Uh, e isso significa, do ponto de vista do cânon neotestamentário, que eles são contemporâneos da escrita do Apocalipse de João, que é o único apocalipse como tal no nosso Novo Testamento. Both Second Baruch and Fourth Ezra were written in response to the destruction of the temple in the year 70. Uh, e tanto o segundo Baruch quanto quarto Ezra, quatro Esdras foram escritos como uma reação à destruição do templo no ano 70. Their way of explaining what had happened with the destruction of the temple was apocalyptic. E, e a maneira deles explicarem essa destruição do templo foi em modos apocalípticos. But what makes these books so rich is that they include a great variety of different materials. E, e o que torna esses dois livros particularmente ricos é a grande variedade de material que eles incluem. And from a Christian perspective, we see many, many parallels between these two books and the New Testament, particularly with the Apostle Paul. Uh, e também os paralelos que podemos perceber entre estes livros e, em particular, né, os escritos do Apóstolo Paul. I mentioned just one example, and then we take the next question. Então eu vou mencionar um exemplo apenas, e depois a gente passa para a próxima pergunta. So the Apostle Paul, in chapter 5 of his Epistle to the Romans, comes up with what scholars call the Adam-Christ typology. Uh, o Apostle Paul, no capítulo 5 da, da Carta aos Romanos, uh, ele elabora aquilo que os pesquisadores chamam de tipologia Adão e Cristo. Paul argues that just as sin entered into the world, through the first Adam, sin is overcome through Christ, who is the second Adam. E a argumentação de Paulo é da seguinte maneira. Já que o pecado entrara no mundo pelo pecado do primeiro Adão, uh, Jesus, que é o segundo Adão, traz esta redenção. Unlike other Jewish books, Second Baruch and Fourth Ezra also argue that sin came into the world through Adam. Uh, e ao contrário de outros escritos judaicos, tanto o segundo Baruch quanto o quatro Esdras uh, argumentam que da mesma maneira o pecado entrou no mundo através do, do primeiro Adão. And in second Baruch we find this passage in which we have a typology but not with Adam and Jesus but with Adam and the Torah. Uh, e 
num dos capítulos de Silvio Baruque, nós encontramos uma tipologia estabelecida não entre Adão e Cristo, mas sim entre Adão e a Torá. And it is quite striking how similar these two arguments are by Paul and by Second Baruch, both in content and in form. E há uma semelhança notável, tanto de conteúdo quanto de forma, entre Segundo Baruch e a argumentação de Paulo em Romanos 5. I'm not saying that one copied the other, but what I am saying is that by reading them side by side, we understand both texts much better. Uh, bom, eu não estou afirmando que um tenha copiado o outro, ou vice-versa, mas sim que a gente aprende muito lendo-os lado a lado. This is only one example, and I could give many, many more, how by reading the Jewish literature around the New Testament, we see things in the New Testament differently, just as by reading the New Testament, we see things in the Jewish literature differently. It really goes both ways. E eu poderia oferecer outros tantos exemplos sobre, o fa sobre esse fato de que uh, a leitura destes escritos judaicos no entorno do Novo Testamento nos auxilia na compreensão do Novo Testamento, bem como a própria leitura e compreensão do Novo Testamento nos ajuda na compreensão dos escritos judaicos nesse mesmo período. É uma via de mão dupla. It is very, very important that we do not simply read the Jewish literature as background to the New Testament, but that we read the New Testament as part of the rich Jewish literature of the time. E é importante destacar que nós não devemos ler esta literatura judaica como se fosse um mero pano de fundo para o Novo Testamento, e sim que nós devemos ler o Novo Testamento como parte desses escritos judaicos deste período. Excelente. Obrigado, professor. Paulo, você Thank quer you, fazer professor. alguma coisa? Excelente. Sim, Marcelo. É... Primeiro, agradecer muito a fala do professor Matias. First, I would like to thank you for your, your presentation. Thank you. É, em especial, porque além do grupo Rastros, nós temos um grupo que estuda também memória paulina na graduação. Uh, and especially because uh, we have uh, both the, the research group called Rastros, or Traces, uh, and, uh, and also we have an undergraduate study group that researches Pauline memories. Nice. Uh, e temos estudado o impacto da literatura do Segundo Templo no pensamento paulino. Começamos pela Septuaginta. Uhum, uhum, uhum. And, and, uh, and we, we studied the impact the Second Temple writings have on uh, the Pauline uh, corpus, uh, starting with the Septuagint. Então, a fala foi muito importante. So, so your, your lecture was uh, very important, very helpful. Very good. Agora, uma pergunta um pouco mais hermenêutica. Uh, but now uh, a question that's, that's more hermeneutical in nature. Mm -hmm. Porque uma das justificativas para a ênfase na literatura do Antigo Testamento mais primitiva era a questão de um judaísmo puro. Uh, you've mentioned that one of the reasons why scholars at first focused on the, the earliest Old Testament writings was due to this uh, purity uh -huh. they expected to find there. Uh -huh. é, mas se lermos um pouco mais a sério essas, essas literaturas, vemos que a diversidade já estava presente de uma maneira muito grande. But if we delve deeper into the, this, this very text, these old texts, we're going to notice that diversity was already present. E eu falo isso porque a mesma coisa acontece com o cristianismo primitivo. And I mention this because the very same thing happens when we talk about primitive Christianity. 
é, mesmo os estudos do cristianismo judaico da Galileia tentam mostrar o Jesus da Galileia ligado a uma pureza cristã é, que não tinha impacto sofrido pelo helenismo, né? Uh, because we have some uh, studies uh, regarding the primitive Christians in Galilee and the, this uh, Jesus movement in Galilee that supposedly didn't have as much, weren't as, mu as much impacted by Hellenism as elsewhere. Mas o que a gente percebe também é que esse, é, essa troca ou essa influência é muito grande. But uh, we can notice that even in this aspect, uh, we can notice many exchanges and influences going around. É, então, a questão mais hermenêutica é exatamente essa. Não há uma dificuldade, tanto do judaísmo como do cristianismo, de lidar com a sua pluralidade, que é presente desde sempre? Uh, and so, so my hermeneutical question would be, uh, so uh, aren't we talking about a very profound difficulty uh, that both Christianity and Judaism have with acknowledging uh, their diversity that was there from the beginnings? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. A very good question. Muito obrigado, ótima pergunta. So the problem with the first temple period is that there is so much we do not know. Bom, o, o problema relativo ao período do primeiro tempo é que há, há muitas lacunas, coisas que não sabemos. We just know so much more about the different groups that kept forming throughout the second temple period. But, por outro lado, nós sabemos muito mais sobre os vários grupos que continuamente se formaram no período do Segundo Templo. The body of literature that we have from the First Temple period is just much more limiting in that regard. E, e a esse respeito, a própria diversidade de literatura que temos no período do Primeiro Tempo é muito menor, né? And, and yet, in the texts that survive this constant exchange between different groups does not appear to be a major issue. Ah, e mesmo assim, né, falando desses textos que sobreviveram desse período, parece que esta questão das trocas entre diversos grupos não era tão proeminente. And this is very different in the second temple period when in fact more and more groups formed. Um, and became independent of the temple in Jerusalem, a phenomenon that didn't quite exist in the same uh, during the first temple period. Uh, e o que aconteceu foi que no período do segundo templo, uh, vários grupos surgiram e se desenvolveram à parte do templo de Jerusalém, algo que não podemos perceber com tanta clareza no período do primeiro templo. But as far as Christianity is concerned, I fully agree with you. Mas, claro, no que diz respeito ao cristianismo em si, eu, eu concordo plenamente contigo. That from the very beginning, there was not a Christianity, there were multiple Christianities. Uh, que desde os primórdios não havia cristianismo, havia cristianismos. I hinted at this at the very end of my talk when I said that only in the second and third centuries uh, were the church father actively um, narrowing the number of Christian groups to form what we might call orthodoxy. Uh, e eu até sugeri isso na conclusão da minha fala quando eu mencionei que, por volta do século II e III, os pais da igreja tentaram estreitar né, os grupos de cristianismo e formarem algo como uma ortodoxia. E, de novo, eu só hinted at this at the very end. It is quite interesting to see the same phenomenon in the second century on the Jewish and on the Christian side. Uhum. -huh. 
E, e claro, foi só uma sugestão, assim, né? Ficou no ar, assim, na minha fala, uh, essa ideia, mas é interessante observar que um processo muito semelhante aparecer, uh, aconteceu simultaneamente junto no, no, do, do judaísmo, né? De formação de uma ortodoxia. So, just to summarize, I agree completely with you that Christianity from the beginning was exceedingly diverse. On the Jewish... Então, para concluir, uh, okay. uh, concordo plenamente contigo de que desde os primórdios o cristianismo foi diverso. I'm not so sure that the same is true of the first temple period. I think it was much more homogeneous and much more focused on the temple. Já não tenho tanta certeza no que diz respeito ao período do primeiro templo, pois me parece que era menor quantidade de grupos, mais focado no templo, algo mais homogêneo. Ok. Eu queria só é, fazer o comercial, então, do livro, da versão em português que nós temos. Está aqui, ó. cuidado com o vão, da editora Ambigrama, que é da querida Elisângela Soares, uma edição primorosa. Falar que é, boa parte da, da, da conferência está no livro, porém, o livro tem muito mais coisa que não está na conferência. Então, vocês têm aí uma, uma oportunidade de entender muito bem essa relação entre o judaísmo e o movimento de Jesus, o judaísmo do segundo templo e o movimento de Jesus. E, há um, e há, eu diria até que esse, essa obra ela, ela dá um passo além naquilo que se chama de pesquisa de Jesus histórico, porque ela trabalha com elementos consistentes na relação da literatura, coisa que, às vezes, a, a, a pesquisa de Jesus histórico parece que ignora todo o, o entorno no qual o movimento de Jesus nasceu. Mas isso aí é também assunto para outra conversa nossa. Você faz um resumo aí para o para o Natias, Carlos, uma questão até de, né, de, de, de gentileza. Just to sum up what Marcelo said, he was presenting uh, your book in translation to Portuguese, and he said that uh, pretty much all that you have shared with us in your talk today is, uh, in a way, part of this book. But in the book, of course, uh, you go much deeper, and there are other aspects that you haven't talked about today, and that your book is not only a very nice contribution for the studies of the intertestament period, but also uh, offers, a, in a way, a breakthrough in what we call the historical Jesus research, because much of what's been written about the historical Jesus uh, doesn't acknowledge or doesn't take too seriously uh, the Jewish writings that were circling around. And so your book is actually very helpful in that it takes it very seriously. And so it offers a wonderful insight for the current uh, so-called historical Jesus research. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK. Nós agora vamos fazer o seguinte. Eu e o Paulo vamos sair daqui, vamos para o back, background, bastidores. Vocês vão ficar sozinhos e eu vou apresentar as perguntas que foram feitas, tá bem? Okay, so now uh, Marcelo and Professor Paulo are going backstage and we're up and, and Marcelo will start to, to make the questions pop up. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, can you read it? Uh, I need to read it in Portuguese, okay? Uh, when it's written in English, I translate into Portuguese and vice versa. Okay. Uh, quais são os, os fatores que uh, dão conta da consolidação do judaísmo rabínico como uma força importante a surgir uh, após a destruição do Segundo Templo e que leva a quase desaparecimento de outras versões? Ok. Yeah, that's a very good and important question. É uma ótima pergunta, muito importante. When the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, Judaism had to reinvent itself. Com a destruição do templo em Jerusalém, o judaísmo precisou se reinventar. There are laws in the Torah that stipulate that Jews have to go to the temple in Jerusalem to bring sacrifices there. Havia leis na Torá que estipulavam que os judeus deviam se apresentar em Jerusalém 
para oferecer sacrifícios no templo. There was an understanding that God dwelled in the temple of Jerusalem. Havia a compreensão de que Deus habitava no templo de Jerusalém. And so the task was to reinvent a form of Judaism that was faithful to the laws, but that could exist without the temple. Então o desafio era elaborar uma forma de judaísmo que fosse fiel às leis, mas que também pudesse existir na ausência do templo. The rabbis, above all, were pragmatists. E os rabinos, acima de tudo, eram pragmáticos. They, more like any other group, were concerned with day-to-day -day matters of the Jewish faith. E eles, mais que qualquer outro grupo, se preocupavam com os aspectos cotidianos da fé judaica. They formalized the prayers of the day and named them after the sacrifices at the temple. Eles formalizaram as orações dos dias, né? E as denominaram com a terminologia dos sacrifícios oferecidos no templo. Synagogues had already been formed well before the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. Já se haviam formado sinagogas bem antes da destruição do templo de Jerusalém. So the rabbis, who in the very beginning had really no power whatsoever, took advantage of this rich web of synagogues. Então os rabinos que até a destruição do templo não tinham tanto poder assim, Uh, se aproveitaram dessa rede bastante ampla uh, de comunidades de sinagogas. They made the reading of the Torah the center of worship gatherings as well as the interpretation of the Bible. Uh, eles uh, tornaram a leitura e a explanação da Torá o centro das reuniões para prestar, prestar culto. But it is also very important that they really had no interest in apocalyptic thinking. E, e é muito interessante que eles não tinham uma grande, uma grande interesse em escritos apocalípticos. Many of the texts that I spoke about today are very apocalyptic. They talk about the end of days. They talk about the heavens, about angels and demons. These were not interest, of interest to the rabbis. Bom, alguns dos textos que eu mencionei hoje eram bastante apocalípticos. Eles se preocupavam com o final dos tempos, visões do céu, do paraíso, figuras angelicais, demoníacas, e esses não eram temas muito queridos pelos rabinos. They were interested in halakha, in Jewish law, whereas in the literature that I talked about today, There is almost no halakha. There is almost no mentioning of any Jewish law. Uh, os rabinos se preocupavam muito com a halakha, né? Essa, uh, esses aspectos legais aplicados ao cotidiano. E nas, nos livros que eu mencionei hoje, há pouco ou quase nada disso. So the answer to your question is that the rabbis won, if you will, because they were pragmatic. They helped people live their day-to-day -day life, and they did not engage with any end-time speculations. Uh, e, assim, para responder de maneira direta a sua pergunta, os rabinos venceram, né? porque eles tinham essa preocupação com o dia a dia, com o cotidiano das pessoas, e não se importavam tanto assim com essas especulações sobre o final dos tempos. I give a concrete example. Eu vou dar um, um exemplo completo. When you go to a Christian funeral, there is a chance that the priest or the pastor will talk about the resurrection. The priest or pastor will talk about the deceased now living in heaven and at one day we will see each other again after the resurrection of the dead. Para dar um exemplo, né? Hoje em dia, se você vai a um funeral uh, de um cristão, de uma cristã, é 
muito provável que o padre ou o pastor que estão conduzindo o ofício fúnebre façam alguma menção à ressurreição dos mortos ou ao fato de que a pessoa falecida está nesse momento no céu, no paraíso, e que, de alguma maneira, nós haveremos de nos encontrar novamente. Judaism today is rabbinic Judaism. When you go to a... Go ahead. O judaísmo de hoje é o judaísmo rabini. If you go to a Jewish funeral today, the rabbi will not talk about the resurrection of the dead. The rabbi will not say that grandmother is in a better place today and that soon we will all meet each other again. Uh, se você for a um funeral judaico hoje, você não vai ouvir o rabino falando sobre a ressurreição dos mortos, ou que o fulano de tal está num lugar melhor do que nós agora e que haveremos de nos encontrar novamente. The difference between is that Christianity, from its very beginning, was very much oriented towards the end of time. It was very much apocalyptic. Uma questão importante é que o cristianismo, o cristianismo desde os seus primórdios, tinha esta orientação apocalíptica voltado para o final dos tempos. Whereas the rabbis, for really practical, more than ideological reasons, rejected this kind of thinking. Enquanto os rabinos, muito por razões práticas, acabavam rejeitando esse tipo de especulação e de ensinamento. And as a consequence, the many texts that were written during the Second Temple period that are more eschatological or apocalyptic simply were not copied anymore. E por conta disso, muitos desses textos mais escatológicos ou apocalípticos produzidos no período do segundo tempo pararam de ser tão copiados. Uh, in Houston, where I live, I give a lot of talks in synagogues throughout the city. Eu, eu moro em Houston e, e costumo falar bastante nas sinagogas ali. And the Jews of the synagogue do not know these early Jewish texts because they are not taught in the synagogue today. Uh, e os judeus hoje não conhecem na sinagoga estes textos porque, na verdade, não, não, isso não é ensinado para eles. And the reason why that is is that the rabbis soon after the destruction of the temple, really didn't engage this literature. It props up here and there. There are some discussions in the Talmud, but the literature as such only survives because Christians translated it. Uh, então, a, a verdade é que esses, uh, esses rabinos, logo após a destruição do templo em Jerusalém, eles não tinham tanto interesse nestas questões. Ela aparecia aqui, a colar, existe uma discussão aqui ou a colar no Talmud, mas na prática esses textos que mencionei sobreviveram muito por conta da sua reprodução, da sua tradução por cristãos. I think I leave it with that. Take a next question. Próxima pergunta, por favor. Bom, vocês conseguem ler aí na tela em português, eu vou traduzi-la para o professor. So, I'm going to translate the question to you. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Professor Henzi. Uh, uh, could uh, we say that perhaps there were uh, changes, both additions and perhaps uh, suppressions to the original Septuagint text? Uh, Uh, to, to what extent do the, the, these uh, alterations and changes uh, distance uh, the Septuagints from the pseudepigraphic texts? texts? Yeah. Uh, I... <clears throat> okay, go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah. Have you understand? Have you, did you understand what I said? Would you like uh, me to elaborate and clarify? I... I... A little bit. 
uh, the the connection between the Septuagint and the pseudepigrapha is a little vague, but let me try to answer and then you jump in. And um, it is true that the Septuagint is not a straight translation of the Hebrew text as we have it today. Bom, é verdade que a Septuaginta não é uma tradução literal do texto hebraico que nós temos em mãos hoje. And so the question is, did the translators change the Hebrew text or did they have a different Hebrew text in front of them? Então a pergunta que se põe é, será que os tradutores fizeram alterações no texto que tinham em mãos ou eles tinham um texto diferente em mãos ao fazer a tradução? So for example, are the changes theologically motivated? Será que são alterações motivadas teologicamente? My colleagues who study the Septuagint debate this all the time. Os meus colegas que pesquisam Septuaginta debatem isso o tempo todo. So a good example would be uh, Genesis 6, the story of the fallen angels. Genesis 6, verses 1 through 4. Uh, um exemplo bom disso seria aquele que está em Gênesis, capítulo 6, versos 1 ao 4, a, a história dos anjos caídos. There, the Greek and the Hebrew differ in important ways from each other. Uh, e há, neste caso, uma diferença muito importante entre as versões hebraica e grega. I mentioned the book of Enoch earlier on which as its center, its core, has the story of the fallen angels. Eu já mencionei o livro de Enoch, e, e no centro do livro de Enoch está justamente essa, essa história da queda dos anjos, dos anjos caídos. And it seems that the version that we have in the Septuagint is in a way closer to the way in which the story is told in First Enoch than it is to the Hebrew text. E, em certo sentido, a versão que nós temos na Septuaginta se assemelha muito mais à versão presente no livro de Enoque do que no texto hebraico. So that might be an example where the Greek translator uh, did, in fact, know of the Enochic literature and translated the text with this knowledge in the back of his mind. Então, pode ser um exemplo caso aí do, do tradutor da Septuaginta, ao fazer sua tradução, ter uh, familiaridade com esse material de Enoch e ter feito a tradução com isso em mente. Another example, just to mention this very briefly, is the book of Jeremiah. Um outro exemplo breve sobre isso está no livro de Jeremias. The book of Jeremiah in the Septuagint is very different from the MT, the Hebrew version of Jeremiah. Uh, o livro de Jeremias na Septuaginta é muito diferente da versão da Bíblia hebraica. It is shorter by about one fifth, and it rearranges the order of the chapters. Ele é curto, cerca de mais curto, cerca de 20% menor, e ele reorganiza alguns capítulos. There is a very rich literature attributed to Jeremiah and his scribe Baruch that we know of from Qumran, from the Apocrypha, there's the book of Baruch, and the Pseudepigrapha. Uh, e existe uma grande quantidade de literatura atribuída ao Jeremias, ou ao seu escribo, o Baruch, uh, que a gente conhece desde os manuscritos do Mar Morto, uh, os textos pseudepígrafos. And so now we can, again, compare the two different versions of the book of Jeremiah, the Hebrew and the Greek, with the texts that come at a later point, the rich Jeremianic literature, and to see whether it presupposes the Greek or the Hebrew version. E aí a gente poderia entabular essas comparações desse corpus jeremiânico, né? Uh, no que diz respeito à sua semelhança com a Septuaginta, ou com estes textos que foram produzidos, ou com a Bíblia hebraica. So these are just two examples in which Septuaginta studies can be 
very important for our understanding of the apocrypha and the pseudepigrapha. Então, esse é um exemplo da importância que os estudos da Septuaginta têm para a compreensão dos apócrifos e dos, dos pseudepígrafos. Não mais perguntas. Não tem mais perguntas. Ok. <risos> nós vamos, então... Nós já também, também já estamos com uma hora e quarenta de, de atividade. Né? Acredito que foi bastante elucidativo. É, eu penso sempre que, quando tem pouca pergunta, às vezes é porque ficou muito claro para as pessoas e também porque elas estão pensando aí o que, que pode desdobrar né, daí para frente. Eu acho mais é que o pessoal está mesmo pensando, <risos> porque tem muita coisa para pensar. <risos> Carlos, pode, pode traduzir. E temos uh, no further questions. And Professor Marcelo has said that uh, it is either because the presentation was very clear or that the students are considering and uh, thinking thoroughly uh, of, the, uh, of all the implications of what you've just said. And, and Professor Paula said, that's probably the reason why there are no more questions. <laughs> Very good, very good. It, it, it's significant that it isn't clear your speech. It was very, very clear, but the question is very, very hard to think. Yes, yes. It takes time. Yeah, we need, we need to take time to, to think yes. about this. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Good. Uh, bom, gente. Então, nós vamos encerrar a atividade. Eu quero agradecer mais uma vez a Matias. Espero que seja a primeira de muitas contribuições de parceria entre nós. É um projeto que a gente está trabalhando aí para médio e longo prazo. E agradecer a vocês que estiveram conosco e ao Carlos Guilherme, principalmente também, que ajudou aí a construir esse momento com a gente. E desejar a todos e a todas uma boa tarde. Até mais. Ok. Matias, é, é, traduz para Matias só para não ficar estranho. Ok. Né? Uh, well, uh, uh, Professor Marcelo expressed his thanks for you and, and he looks forward to uh, further contributions and participations and middle and long term goals in this research partnership. And also, he, he has thanked me as a translator and helper to help things work out. Thank you. It's been a delight to be with you. And I hope that we can continue our collaboration. That would be very nice. Obrigado, nice. foi um grande prazer estar com vocês e também estou muito desejoso de continuarmos nossa colaboração. Ok. Muito obrigado, gente. Thank you. Tchau, tchau. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.